You're listening to the Good Food CFO podcast, where we challenge the status quo of the food industry, celebrate good food founders who are building businesses on their own terms, introduce industry disruptors, and are redefining equitability. If you're ready to build your financial confidence and join the good food revolution to change the way the food industry does business, you are in the right place. I'm the Good Food CFO and your host, Sarah Delavan. Sarah, I can't wait for our listeners to hear this episode. You got to sit down with a founder that is in the like pre-launch, pre-revenue stage of their business. Yeah. Jason McAlpin is the founder and CEO of Deo, which is a sparkling water that combines incredible flavor with functional ingredients like probiotics, vitamin D, L-theanine, if I'm pronouncing that properly, all without sugars, sweeteners, or anything artificial. And as you mentioned, the brand hasn't launched yet. It is set to launch this year. And Jason joined me to talk about the work that he did throughout the pre-launch process. It was a really energizing conversation, and I'm super excited for folks to hear it. But before we get to that, we just read an article that I really want to talk about. Yeah, totally. We just finished reading this article, and it was from Food Industry Executive titled Facing Less Tolerance for Price Increases, CP Companies Shift to Growing Volume. The information that was presented like here in this article is all from a report that was put together by Deloitte. It was their Consumer Products Industry Outlook Report. And what I found really interesting in their insights and and, like through the information presented in this article was really around products and pricing. Yeah. The report is based on a survey of 250 consumer products executives. Not a ton of executives in my opinion, but that's who they've surveyed. It's also based on an analysis of the top 100 companies in the industry based on revenue, right? So as the title indicates, these executives believe that they can no longer rely on price increases to drive growth in revenue and profitability this year. And that's because customers are no longer willing to pay higher prices. They have found that current grocery prices may actually be turning customers away from the store and toward takeout options, especially when the prices are equal or better, right, in in terms of the takeout options. And as a result of that, they also expect retailers to challenge any price increases. Yeah. And because of all of that, Sarah, companies are actually steering away from price hikes, Of this, you know, the 250 executives that were surveyed for this report, only 2% of those executives said that raising prices was a part of their strategy for this year. Mm -hmm. While most of the CP executives, 62% to be exact, are planning to shift to more profitable products and pack sizes. I think this article is really interesting for a couple of different reasons. One, and if we're going back to the I can no longer stay quiet episode, right, where we talked about what the industry was doing at that point in time, right, raising prices, not due to actual cost increases, but because they felt and studies had shown that they could raise prices, there was price elasticity, right? Mm -hmm. People were willing, people believed that inflation, right? And, and supply chain and all of these issues were the reason that prices were being increased. But in reality, it was corporate greed, right? That was driving the prices higher. So, I mean, there had to be a ceiling and we've hit the ceiling. And, you know, I, I can't talk about this news article without pointing that out, right? Because I think if, if we don't say it, allows people to believe that I believe that they were raising prices for good reason, right? Um, All along. So I think that's important to say. The other thing though, that I think is interesting here is that, you know, we talk about a lot of these things here, right? In the good food space, brands are typically charging the true cost of food, not always, but often, 
And mm-hmm. even if they're they're not like really, you know, their their prices are not truly representative of the true cost because of what the market is willing to pay, we're I would say 99.9% of the time, right, a higher priced product on shelf than the like commodity competitor. So there was not a lot of wiggle room for good food brands to increase their pricing all along, you know? Yeah. And so as a strategy, you know, one that we talk about here a lot, it's always trying to figure out what are our most profitable products? What are the products that are going to get us the margin that we need? And how and where do we offer those so that we can build a financially successful business? And it's just so interesting to think about, you know, <laughs> returning to those types of practices as the article is talking about. The other thing I want to point out about this article too, I'm just like kind of looking back at the title. It says that the companies are shifting to growing volume. And what's interesting when you dig into, there's like a little pie chart within the article and then underneath it, it states that they're not just talking about volume in general, like not all volume is created equally. What they're talking about is profitable volume, right? Which is another thing that we talk about here all the time. You know, this idea that if you're selling at a 30% margin and then you sell a really high volume, at no point is that really going to affect your cash flow in a positive way, right? Because 30% is not a great margin. These big businesses are not doing that either. They want higher margin products to be the ones that are also selling at volume. And the article goes on to talk a bit about how are they going to do this? There's going to be marketing strategies, right? So we're going they're going to be talking about sustainability and traceability and things that are important to the consumer. And they're going to also be examining, you know, special occasion purchasing campaigns, like things of that nature. And I'm not one to say often emulate your good food brand after a corporation, right? Like it's not a thing you're going to hear me say often. But what I do think is a valuable takeaway here is examining the profitability of your products, right? This is not new information for for us here at the podcast. We've talked about it before. We've talked about the price versus margin conundrum, right? And you know, what products may you get rid of in your product mix? What products might you offer in one channel, but not in another to protect the profitability of that channel, right? The other thing that they mention in the article is this idea of having a willingness to prune and refresh their portfolio Mm. and their product set perpetually. And that to me kind of stood out because I was talking to a client about this recently, right? It's like, Sometimes I think as a small business, we have like our product. This is the product that we sell, right? But that might be a low margin product. It might be difficult to to get the margins we need in all of our channels. And so what about the idea of a modified version of that product or a different product entering the product channel that has a higher margin or maybe can can fill a gap and sort of add to the profitability. And so this idea of like pruning, but also considering adding a new product, I'm not one for like new, 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 new all of the time, right? There's a cost investment, you know, that that comes along with that. I think having a reasonably sized like SKU set, you know, makes sense. You don't need to have a bajillion products, but really examining where can I sell with this and and what channels does it work in and, and do I need to make any changes? When I think about the the benefits of thinking like a larger corporation, it's the an like the analytics, the analysis, the mm-hmm. the sort of ugh, for better or for worse, like removing emotion from some of the decisions that you make. <laughs> you made you were making me think uh, the word ruthless, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Being ruthless, yeah, and not in a negative way, right? But ruthless about these are the margins that I need. And I want to be ruthless about being a financially successful business. And yeah, making decisions that you might be like, this is my favorite flavor. And I love it, but I cannot make it profitable or I can only sell it D to C, you know, and it's limiting my business in some way. Then saying, I understand that. And so let me open my mind to what else 
I can do or how else I can serve my customer in a meaningful way. So and I love that you when you talk about like the pruning and and you know examining that it's like not necessarily getting rid of anything in your product line that doesn't have the most favorable margin mm-hmm. but it's real it sounds like you know from what you were saying it's really about examining your blend mm-hmm. and does the blend work in that particular sales channel exactly exactly yeah so you know again we're not we're not uh, big proponents of emulating big corporations lots of things that they do that we are not fans of but i do think and the reason that we do this the reason that we read you know articles from civil eats but then also read you know what where was this article from industry executives yeah uh yeah. where we're you know where we're like they're really highlighting you know the a certain type of business let's just say you know we've got to keep our eye on all parts of the industry we definitely need to keep an eye on what these larger you know brands are doing in terms of what are they focusing on? What are the trends that they're seeing? What are the things that they're doing from a marketing perspective, right? That we need to be aware of, especially as it starts to trend toward sustainability, regenerative, you know, farming mm-hmm. practices, traceability, things of that nature. It's important to to be aware of and to kind of learn from in some ways, or actually in many ways, right? So that we can be educated business founders and and consultants in our case. Yeah. Well, speaking of educated founders and consultants and the like, I seriously, I cannot wait for our listeners to hear this episode. I think that, you know, Jason, um, the founder of of Deo, has so much experience in the space and really knows how to look at building a business and listening to the two of you go back and forth and really share that information. I know when I was editing it, I was like, yes, yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So I'm excited. Yeah. I mean, I didn't mention this earlier in the episode, but he spent nine years at Coca-Cola in brand management across really iconic brands like Coke Zero, Coke, Powerade, and Vitamin Water. So he's a guy who comes, as you said, with a lot of experience in the beverage space. And it's so interesting to to watch the shift. And that's why I was so interested in having a conversation with him pre-launch. I Mm -hmm. just, I wanted to dig into what are you taking from Coke, right? And what are you bringing to what is considered a small business, a brand new business, right? And, you know, I just found our conversation really fascinating. And I think, yeah, as you said, founders are really going to enjoy listening to Jason and how excited he is about the work, which is something that, you know, we, we also try to talk about here a lot. Like it takes work. You got to, you got to, dive into the numbers and figure things out. And he's been at it for, I think, almost two years now, pre-launch. So without further ado, we should let folks listen to our conversation. We hope you enjoy it. Are you looking for support to tackle the financial work of growing or sustaining a profitable food business without hiring a consultant? Or maybe you want a different way to look at your food business financials. Now you can join Sarah Delavan for the weekly CFO office hours inside the Good Food CFO community. Our setting allows you to get FaceTime with Sarah and a small group of your peers. Each week, the group will dive into the work that you're doing, support you when you're feeling stuck, and give you the confidence that you're on the path to profitability. February passes are on sale now. You can get more information by going to thegoodfoodcfo.com and clicking on services. Welcome to the podcast, Jason. Thank you. So glad to be here. Yeah, I'm so glad to have you. I don't remember how we got connected. I feel it, like maybe it was through Michael from it Brand was Directory. Uh, Brand Directory, uh, and I just completed a pitch competition. I think that's kind of how we got connected that way. Okay, I love that. Yeah, and then I remember I watched you on BevNet. There was a video online when I was sort of like, okay, who is this guy? And you know, what are, what is he up to? I I saw you there and I thought, okay, this could be a really 
A, it's an interesting concept, but also an interesting podcast topic because we've not spoken to someone who's still in the pre-launch phase of yes, their business. And which means there's a lot of nuances when it comes to fundraising and selling in without any type of historical sales data and positioning visitors the competition and shelf that. So I'm happy to talk all those nuances. Yeah, I'm so excited to dig into this. So why don't we kind of back up a little bit and just talk about your background? Do you have an experience in the food and beverage industry? And then how did you get the idea to launch Deo? Yeah, so I'm I'm a former Coca Cola guy. Uh, I did brand management at Coke for about nine years. Okay. Uh, I managed brands like Coke and Coke Zero, Powerade, Vitamin Water. Uh, one of the things that I did before I left Coke uh, during COVID was I relaunched the Vitamin Water brand with you know consumer architecture, pricing, profit sharing agreements, trade spin and market, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. New, all new formulas, new innovation. But before that, I actually uh, received an MBA from UNC, University of North Carolina. Prior to that, I launched Under Armour's first ever basketball footwear business. Oh, wow. In, in Baltimore, Maryland, which is a whole story. I can talk <laughs> about how I ended up there, which is kind of interesting. But it made sense doing basketball footwear because I actually played basketball in college at the University of Maryland. So, you know, first gig out of college, I was doing Under Armour's basketball footwear. So could have been worse. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Could have been worse. Okay. So you left Coca-Cola, you said in 2020 or during the pandemic at some point? Yeah, very late 2020. And I left because there was, you know, as everyone was going through various kind of layoffs and Coke was doing voluntary separation and mm. uh, with some, some great severance. And it just happened to be that my son was coming and it was, was meant to be, it was due two days after what would have been my final day. Oh. So here I am and I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying Coke's a fantastic company, but I say, wow, what a great chance to take my, my severance and, and, be a stay at home dad for a few months. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, so I raised my hand and said, guys, I'll voluntarily step away. And, and that's what I did for several months is just wiped a bunch of noses and rocked a bunch of babies <laughs> in sleep and, uh, uh, and try to figure out what I want to do next. I had no idea what I was going to do. Yeah. And, and that's actually, you know, several months of being able to kind of think and reflect is how I ended up on, uh, uh thinking of Dale. Yeah. So why don't you tell our listeners, what Deo water is about and sort of what your mission is and and then also kind of yeah what led to okay this is the product that I want to create for sure yeah it, and it actually came during those times where I'm sleep deprived with the newborn and I'm, I'm eating fast food and and just all over the place and so I'm sick I'm tired I'm, I'm, I'm my diet's terrible so I've been I've, I've turned to these different type of kind of solutions the kombuchas here or the yeah. energy drinks there or these wellness turmeric shots and things and I was just all over the place just just mind and gut were just well all over the place and you know I kind of think like I you know I, I, I want a great tasting refreshing water brand but that still had those things right I, yeah. I like the I like a bit of the caffeine I needed, but I don't want the 30 other ingredients that come in energy drinks or yeah. I want the probiotics from kombucha, but I don't want the vinegary, the fermentation type of, you know, and I certainly don't enjoy the turmeric wellness shots that, you know, so, but I do want the immune health boost. Right. And I was like, man, I just, I want the, give me, give me kind of both of those things. And and that's how I came up with Dea, which, you know, I, I kind of shorthand call it just, it's a, it's a better sparkling water where mm. it's a just a great tasting sophisticated flavorful sparkling water but with functional ingredients that help your body and mind so think self-stable probiotics or caffeine and l-theanine to help you focus so like high electrolytes to really help you rehydrate or vitamin d and e and b12 and zinc and selenium to help your immune system yeah. but all with zero sugar zero sweeteners no artificiality it is a through the word sparkling water, but that works so much harder. And that was the idea. And that's how I came up with Deo. Yeah. And did you formulate the different beverages that are, that are lined up so beautifully behind you with their pretty colored labels? Um, did you formulate them on your own or did you work with someone to really get it right? You know, I had the strategy of what I wanted the flavor to do, what I wanted the ingredients. And part of this was, you know, just kind of being in and adjacent to the industry.
I did all of that before I really kind of decided to, to move forward. And I fully burdened, when I say fully burdened, I've kind of, you know, full distributor margin, full retailer margin, full promotion of calendar, full trade spend, fully burdened my value chain and said, yeah. okay, under this worst case scenario, can I still make money at the price that needed to get frequency in the category and therefore outperform the category? And then that therefore helped me illuminate how much can I spend on bottle, on label, on cap, on corrugate box, on ingredients, et cetera. Yeah. That gave me my sphere of kind of realistic, you know, spend. Then I could go work with my vendor. And then even then, first few rounds came back. It was more than I could do. I've, I've you know, had to, to, to tell vendors, I love what you do, but unfortunately, I just can't afford yeah. you to maintain my, my margin. Uh, and then others work with you and you find the right balance and you move forward. But that upfront work was incredibly important just to make sure you've got the right balance of profit and price. Yeah. And I want to ask a, another question. It doesn't sound like you had in your mind, well, this is higher than I want my cost to be right now, but down the road somewhere, we'll we'll hit an, a certain level of scale where my cogs will come down and then the profit will come. I'm not hearing that in in your story. It's a trap. It, it's a it's a it's a big trap. It's not that it's completely untrue, right? There are tiered pricing, but as you get your tiered price and not always ask for tiered pricing, I say okay, because I like to project out 5 yeah. years and kind of know what the future looks like. Yeah. But as you get though, they're not as steep as you would expect, right? And some come with extreme volume. Yeah. Um and so it's a bit of a trap to say yeah, I'm going to start with 5% margin today, but in another two years, I'll be at 50. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it. Now, what I have done, though, which I think my investors really appreciated, too, was I'm, I've am i put into the plan, the five-year plan, specific actions I'm going to take at specific years to actually introduce more margin into the brand. So how do you think about your not just changing or, or hoping you get scale with your packaging, but actually evolving your packaging to some mm. lower cost packaging along the way based off of the channel you go to? Right. How do you think about changing your channel mix where you get some higher margin in certain channels, lower margin in others? Yeah. How do you think about that? You know, how do you think about your sourcing? And so if you're bringing it in from, you know, overseas or how do you bring that domestically? So I have... But a margin expansion plan that takes you from here to there to there over time where scale doesn't actually factor into it. So it's the only it. kind of upside of scale. Oh my gosh. That's going to make a highlight reel. I'm sure of it. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. So then, okay. So you've done that work and then, and then what was the the next step after really dialing in your, your costs and your margin? Yeah. Well, then it's, 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 it's executed. So you know, it, you could therefore go to like your box supplier, for example, you know, and luckily I'm fortunate because I've worked within, you know, uh, with box suppliers in the past. And so I kind of know some of the terminology. So some of the onboarding was a little bit faster, but you could say, I need this direct print with this kind of execution, this amount of quantity, here's my projection. I need it for this, this amount. Yeah. And it allows you to have a little bit of a factor conversation, less exploratory, a little bit more concrete, and, you know, just about every supplier I've spoke with came outside of that budget at first and said, yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. What also you find, though, is that if they like you and your business, they're oftentimes willing to to, to work with you uh, mm -hmm. if they see kind of the promise and the upside. So luckily, I found some great vendors, some great suppliers who will say, OK, a little bit higher, but we'll come here. Right. Yeah. And, and, and we'll kind of grow with you. Yeah. I want to talk about financial modeling that you may have done. Tell me about like a forecast. Tell me about a cash flow plan that you probably created. Any kind of like important information that you think other founders who are maybe pre where you are now or are, you know, thinking about launching a new business or even into a new channel, some of the things that you think are like must do's or that, you know, you couldn't live without. Yeah, it's, it's just such a good question because I feel like it's one that is undervalued when you're starting out. I mean, margin is certainly important, but how that projects out over time. You know, one of the things that I did fairly early is a full capitalization schedule, which uh, I think a lot of my investors also appreciated because mm -hmm. beverages in particular are very expensive. Most, most of CPG is a very kind of capital intensive uh, industry. Yeah. Beverages no, is, is not different at all. And so you're, there are rounds of fundraising that you're going to have to do. And so what I've laid out is that, okay, in year one, we're going to raise this much. We're going to generate this much revenue. Here's a store account. Here's a velocity assumptions. 
and then we're going to therefore raise this much, uh, this much, much money, therefore unlock the next round, which that now raises Y revenue, right? And then I guess the next round to see, and that also allows people to understand what the dilution looks like, right? How much equity will happen over time. But that's an important one as well, because fundraising is a, a challenging game. And as an entrepreneur, right, like the fun stuff is selling and connecting with consumers and showing that you're doing good and showing that people are enjoying your product and your baby and it's fantastic. Not everyone likes to go fundraise. I don't think yeah. anyone likes to go fundraise, but it's a, it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly part, important part. Are you signing up for three, four cycles of raising capital, bringing on investors who are going to keep pulling you in kind of different ways, right? Yeah. Both good and maybe a little distracting. You, you've got to be able to have that answer up front before you dive all the way in. And to feed that, you need to understand what your fully burdened kind of margin looks like, what your sales forecast, I can talk about building up from the bottoms up and how you phase it over time, but then flowing that all the way through your financials, right? Through your op your operating expenses and then through your cash flows and your reinvestment and illuminating where you got some risk and how you fund that risk and how you get to the next one and all the timing of that. That is a very intricate algorithm that I think people really need to do up front before they get too deep. Yeah. I want to dig into that. And, you know, to be really transparent too, like there are listeners to this podcast who they don't necessarily have aspirations of, of being a nationally distributed product. They're yeah. bootstrapping and they may bootstrap their business forever, right? They may never right. get investment. So I definitely think if you're the kind of business that, that, wants expansive growth and you need that funding, that that type of forecast that you just talked about is super important. No matter right. if you've got that aspiration or if you're like, I just want to be a regional brand that right. is profitable and I, I want 100% ownership, whatever it is, mm -hmm. the cash flow projection and that financial forecast, that sales projection, that operating expense projection, everybody needs that. I'm sure my listeners at this point are getting tired of me talking about forecasting, but I will never stop because it's just so important, not only yes. from the perspective of how much money do I need to execute this plan and this goal that I want to achieve, but then what am I measuring yeah. my results against to know if I'm like mm -hmm. on the right track or, or not. So I'm really excited to hear what your approach is to forecasting, yep. you mentioned that the bottom up, and I, we've talked mm -hmm. with uh, Felice Thorpe a little bit on this podcast about that. So yep. yeah, walk us through how you approach forecasting and sort of the steps that you take. Yeah, well, I, first of all, I'll just underline what you said about the importance of it, because it really is everything. I mean, you work with a 3PL, third-party logistics partner, the first thing you're going to say is, what's your forecast? How many orders? You, yeah. you you go to a retailer and they're going to say, okay, well, how many cases and and what do you think you can do and X, Y, Z? It, it's, it forecast is so important. So I, I fully agree. The way I approached it was consumer first. And so I kind of said, all right, where do I want to reach my consumer? Uh, in this case, shopper and consumer. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was, there is this kind of what I call lifestyle destinations that I think sparkling water in my brand makes sense first. Okay. Right? And which is not necessarily some of the bigger boxes immediately. You kind of graduate to those, you know, but where are they spending their time? So for my type of brand, it makes a lot of sense in fast casual restaurants and coffee shops and, you know, at work in markets and actual stores and maybe independent grocery, but it's not mass it's not club it's not not yet right we'll kind of graduate yeah. to those so i said all right well then based off kind of my regional approach let's list out the stores and so i did i've got yeah. a i've got a long spreadsheet of the stores and the address and the other brands that are sold there to understand what makes a lot of sense i've kind of prioritized those based off of what i think that shopper demographic is where i think my brand fits and then I've, at knowing the category and doing some research on the other brands in the category, I've made some assumptions based on the velocity. How quickly do I think the brand will turn, right? And I've, you know, kind of middle of the road, right? And in, in where, where I'm kind of projecting. And then I've used that to come up to a total sales, right? Number of stores, velocity, here's my total sales. And then I've made some assumptions in terms of, right, now I'm going to expand into this retailer, expand into this region. And I've kind of grown that over time with some 
decent specificity. And then, of course, when you have your, your, your economics and your profit margins fully loaded, that drops down pretty quickly into your cash flows. And, and then you start to understand how much operating expense do you need to realize that, you know, team structure, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But I, I start with the very bottom build up from there and then say, OK, well, then this is what I think my projection is, what I need next to, to, to enable that uh, and, and so therefore know what my cash flow runway looks like when the fundraising needs to come in. If yeah. not, how long can I last? All that is just so incredibly important. Yeah. When we do this for folks, I like to do one financial model, which is sort of representative of the of the PL, right? Because I think mm-hmm. that that's very helpful. So we're using, you know, unit economics, right? So for every one unit that we sell, we've got that unit revenue and we've got the unit cogs, you know, built in, right? Mm-hmm. And so we can really see, okay, what is the the forecasted PL look like? We've got our sales targets, we've got our operating expenses, and then the calculated cogs there. But mm-hmm. where that's not really where the like I'll say like that piece of reality that's missing is that actual cash flow, right? Because you're yes. not buying ingredients and a, and a bottle for one unit at a time, right? You're buying, right. you know, cases at a time, whatever you need. And I like to start there first with that sort of PL, what I'll call replicated, you know, financial forecast, and then go to the cash flow and yeah. say, all right, well, now I've got my my targets, my sales targets. I understand what my growth is going to look like. Mm-hmm. How much do I need to spend like now to right. get this started? And then based on the number of units that I'm going to sell over mm-hmm. the month, over whatever it is, when will my next big purchase be? Right. Yes. When will I need new round of bottles? When will I need to purchase more of the ingredients? And what what I think that does, right, is is tells you how much money do I need when? what is my cash runway for those who don't know what that means yet? That's how long the money you have today is going to last you, right? If you're doing promotions, if you're doing free fills or slotting fees, right? That's going to cost you money. And you can, you can literally forecast the dollars and cents in terms of the time that you expect it to go out of your bank account and into your bank account. And I just think there's so much value in that, that, that I like to have both for, for all businesses that, that we work with. I, I, you, you said it much better than I could. I mean, you're exactly right. And I think even when you're especially a small business, you don't have a lot of the credit uh, and the flexible spending terms that some of the more mm-hmm. established brands do. And so, you know, for someone like Deo, for example, a lot of that is bought up front, whereas other ones kind of give you some favorable terms over several months or, yeah. uh, you know, as things uh, and so that's that's a that's another thing you have to kind of keep in mind. And you have to layer in a bunch of other things that right, like allowance for kind of bad debt or or basically invoices yeah. that, that that don't go paid. You have to allowances for pallets that get ruined and uh, all those type of things and, and and returns. And so there's you're absolutely right. And so you you kind of you kind of have, I always like to think of things as kind of like a worst case scenario, Me too. Uh, you know, at least that kind of in the, in the sort of an alien invasion, a worst case scenario, yeah. right? <laughs> so kind of a realistic, but like if, if your expenses are fully realized and you get no savings anywhere, right. And your distributor margin is max, your retail margin is max, your bad debt expenses is max and all those things are maxed. What therefore is your cash situation? Yeah. Do you have the necessary solvency to get to the next milestone? Uh, and you're, and so you're right. That level of visibility is incredibly important. Yeah. Are you similar to me in that? I mean, you are in that we both like to forecast based on worst case scenario. What's the yeah. lowest margin, you know, I could get here. What's the highest, you know, that this could cost what's yeah. But the other, and the other thing is that I like to think about cash very conservatively, Mm -hmm. you know, I like to have a good amount of cash in the business and not, I like to have goals, but not necessarily expect that we're going to reach them in a weird way, like from, from the CFO seat, you know what I mean? Because I think that there's, we can be almost too optimistic sometimes and go, well, I can spend this today because I believe that, that the outcome is going to be the way that I want it to be versus I have enough money to meet my minimum cash requirement and then some 
therefore I can modify my plan or maybe spend a little extra or, or something like that. I'm, I'm just curious how you think about, you know, cause I, I don't like to be totally risk averse, but I also like a bit of a safety net for a business. I, you're exactly right. And I, I kind of joke in that, and I stole this from my old leader, Kevin Plank, but he would all, he used to say when he started out, he would carry around like five or six different business cards. Mm-hmm. One would say chief sales officer, the other one would say chief financial officer, the other one would say C C O O, right? And that's kind of the that's that's how I think about it too, because there are times when you've got to really, you know, believe to your core of a grand plan and you know in my case disrupting a category and, yeah. and and really kind of you know with ambitions and and that can you know that 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 star that you're reaching for and you're going to and galvanize people around you and kind of reach for it and then there you put on your cfo hat and mm-hmm. you say but i've got to make sure i've got what i call shock absorption which is I can handle the, the, if that doesn't come to fruition, which in my investors to the credit ask me oftentimes what happens if that doesn't happen. Right. Right. So you got to have shock absorption in my case. And and I was very kind of honest with my investors. Here's the unaccounted for dollars that I have in this capital race. Right. It's not all accounted for. There's a tremendous amount that I'm saying, I don't know what the future is going to hold entirely, but I'm going to make sure there's money here to handle it when it comes because it will. Don't know yeah. what it is. You know, what happens in kind of a sensitivity of a high, medium, low on things like uh, distributed trade, right? Maybe I'll get lucky and, and there's not as many build backs, and, but we're going to we're gonna make sure that we, we can do that. Yeah. All of those things along kind of that proverbial value chain, I've tried to introduce financial shock absorption so that if and when those shocks do happen, I'm not all of a sudden out of money. Uh, yeah. and have to either put operations on pause or go to other kind of, you know, less favorable financing terms. Yeah. I think that's great. I love that. Anything else you want to share around the forecasting or the cash flow projections that you think is important? I want to reinforce that it is really important and to really try to add in as much as you can, which takes time. There's, there's yeah. a lot of things that like, especially, you know, if you're a first time entrepreneur like myself, first time into the category, there are hidden things that you don't know until you get into it and you realize that, oh, oh my goodness, right? Whether that be some hidden shipping fees, maybe that'd be some 3PL fees that are kind of layered in after the fact, maybe that'd be testing at your co-packer that done afterwards, you didn't quite know. Yeah. You want to you want to really dig deep and ask your vendors and your partners all of your costs, not just your tolling fee, but all of the potential costs that could happen to layer that into your expenses. And then you also want to be, I think, very particular around your burn rate mm. because especially year one, two, three, et cetera, right? And, and the, your, your kind of monthly expenses. I mean, it is, especially in today's investment kind of environment, which is still very kind of very tight. You really had to be prepared to go the long haul without bringing in further external capital. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so managing your monthly expenses and making sure that you've got kind of a really good line of sight to that, incredibly important to managing your, your cash flow as well. So nothing that we've already said, but I think it's just really important. Yeah, I think it's it, it's a good point you're making about it's one thing to project, right? Then you've got to check in with it too, which is sort of, you know, what we already awesome. said, like, you know, the cash flow exists, not just so you can go, Oh, okay, this is doable or, right. okay, I've got three months, you know, worth of, worth of cash here with what I have today. And, you know, maybe six months with the sales I'm projecting, then you got to go, am I on track for this? Right. You know, is my bank account balance on February 1st, what I projected it to be on February mm-hmm. 1st? or not? Mm-hmm. Where where are we really? Are people paying their bills? Are we selling through at the rate we projected or are we selling less? Are we selling more? You know, what, right. what, how is this functioning? Is it functioning according to plan? And if you don't have that plan, then there's, you're sort of just floating. You're kind of, you don't, you don't know how do you make really good it's decisions, a, you know? It's a, it's a hope strategy. Uh, yeah. right. And, and, but even along those, along those lines, you're not selling. Okay. What do you have to do then? We're well, probably going to have to put some marketing, some trade spin in the market to get your velocity back up. Yeah. Are you accounting for that inevitability? So when I think about kind of that fully burdened proverbial value chain, kind of, you know, soup to nuts, I'm assuming that I'm going to have to do that. And I'm going to be pleasantly surprised if your organic velocity uh, behind right. it 
is such that it's not needed for any further steep discounts. And so yeah. I think that's a, just a microcosm, but, a, but an example of how you make sure that kind of worst case or the low end of your best case or, or, or realistic case uh, you're accounting for financially. Yeah. And the other thing I want to just mention here around forecasting is like, we've got a forecasting template and we call it a course. It's just kind of a workshop to, to walk people through how to create a forecast. And it's pretty detailed. And every once in a while I'll go, is it too complex for folks? And then I'll think, well, maybe I should backpedal a little bit. And then I go, no, but I wouldn't project any other way. Right. I, I want to know what products we're selling. I want to know which stores you know, we're approaching in Q1 and what month we we project that we're going to go in and how many units we think we're going to sell. I remember earlier in my career as a consultant, I, I had seen a template for forecasting wholesale sales. And it was like, we're going to be in 50 stores and the velocity per store is, you know, you know, two units per whatever week per, per location. I was like, you're just going to make that assumption across all 50 stores? Right. That doesn't make any sense to me. Right. It's very right. broad and and you you can do that, right? And if you're kind of right. just getting started and that's like what you can do, great. But if you can get more detailed about the kind of store that it is, the shopper yes, there, how exactly. big is that store? Is, you know, not every location that you're in is going to have the same velocity of your product. Right. That you beat me to it because the, the channel, the store type, the geography, the location, the competitive set, all of those things kind of need to factor into your to your breakdown. And and then of course it gets easier when you say, yeah. Oh, I've got this kind of PO or this, you know, I've now sold in, I've got some but you're you're exactly right. It can't be a uh, which is the other trap, which is that well, if I just get, you know, one percent of this market, or if I just get, you know, this kind of of this market, yeah, you really do want to have a bottoms up with specific velocity benchmarks. And the other thing is seasonality and timing. There's a, there's, you know, how do you haircut it for price? Because yes, here's your velocity kind of you know data that you have in this channel, but your price is here, right? Yeah. And how does that change over time? When you go into a new store, your velocity is going to take a hit. You have to build that back up. All that has to factor into your your mind. So as much specificity as you can, the better. Yeah. Get the trade spend in there. Get those mm -hmm. locations in there. I, I love it. And and it just makes me happy when I meet another founder who's like, yeah, let's get into the detail. I was working with a client yesterday actually and I I made a bit of a general forecast for them in terms of sales based on historical and was coming to them for their input. And I was like, I normally like to project a bit more detail. And they're like, yeah. Let's go for it. And I was like, nice, nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what we want to we want to hear. How yeah. long have you been in pre-launch? Uh I say uh, around two years or so. And, and I'm thinking from like developing the you know initial idea to yeah. working with beverage developers, which you, you know. Again, that's a, it's a very tricky formula, but to get to a great product, to raise money, to kind of, you know, get retailer feedback, which I would always encourage as well, mm -hmm. is before you actually start to sell, you know, pop into local retailers. I've used some fantastic pitch competitions that actually sit across from some retailers just to get, you know, and distributors as well, just to get feedback on saying, hey, does this make sense? Could this be successful in your store or on your truck? Yeah. Uh, what do you think about this price? I, that I mean that it takes a it takes a long time. So I'd say about two years now of running all the traps, finding all the vendor ingredient suppliers, and and kind of now getting ready for the the full production, full execution. Yeah, it's very clear that you have done your homework. You have done a ton of research on all sorts of different parts of your business. I I can I've gathered that through the conversation, and also spent a lot of time digging into the numbers, which I'm just like so happy to hear. You've done all of this work. What's happening now? And is there an estimate on when we might see the water on shelves? Yeah, well, I, you know, I'll, I'll say I'm definitely one of the measure twice, cut once, yes, right? And so But the other thing is within, it still might not matter. It is, mm -hmm. it's, it's just risky, uh, especially when you're bringing in outside capital, my own capital, I've invested quite a bit as well. Uh, you want to be responsible. You want to try to try to be as specific and 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 uh, minimize your risk as much as humanly possible. But it still might not matter. Uh, yeah. It's a 
it's a complex category and, and complex business. So now I, I'm excited. I'm bringing on the right agency partner, which I'm really excited about. There's a whole campaign that we'll have that's just, you know, plays on the skepticism of functional mm. products right now and, and being very brutally honest with the drinker about what we will and won't do. A lot of fun we're going to have there. So we're starting to build that out. That's so cool. We're just bringing on all the right kind of final mile partners, right? With the 3PO partner, which I'm also super excited about in terms of their capability and how they'll, they'll be able to grow with us. You know, we've got an operations team that's coming and kind of tying everything together. And, 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 you know, there's a lot that still has to happen. But when it comes to the core, the core is the strategy, the pricing, the capitalization, the the product, the, you know, the taste, all of that is kind of now it's about, all right, let's run the bases, let's execute across the different pieces of that supply chain to, to, to get on the show. So I'll say in the next kind of few months, maybe I'll keep it, uh, you know, fairly piled up. But in the next few months, hopefully you'll see a bit more from data, both in the marketplace and online. I love that. And so just to to confirm your channel strategy, you said, you know, not the not the Kroger's of the world. The, the 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 coffee shops places like that is where you're headed and then will you have a d to c element of the business as well yes that's exactly right so so actually the website is drinkdao.com d-a-i-o drinkdao.com it's there to learn about the brand but it's still kind of coming soon so you can't order yet but that'll be that that direct to consumer component but then yes the one of the things that I love and, and the, a little bit of the mantra that I've always had is I build a beverage business one bottle at a time. Mm. And so I love the idea of you going into a local coffee shop and saying, oh, what is that? Or in your you know hotel lobby as you're traveling or, or wherever it may be. And kind of the cool thing is, which is the, the benefits lend itself to different occasions. So yeah. that natural caffeine makes a lot of sense in coffee shops, your wellness, immune health and hotels, et cetera. But I wanted people to be able to discover it to buy one bottle at a time to try it for, you know, kind of an impulse purchase as opposed to having to buy six at a time. Yeah. Uh, and so you will, you'll see it restaurants, independent markets and natural stores, uh, right. And regional focused grocery, yeah. hospitality, spas, at work, gyms, et cetera. I love it. Well, I'm really excited to follow along, you know, online. And then I'm just going to pitch, maybe you come back and, and talk to us again, maybe at the start of next year or at, at some point where you feel like maybe you've learned a big lesson or had a big win and there's something you, you want to share. I think it'd be kind of cool to stay in touch and, and keep people updated if you're open I'd to it. it. Yeah, That's no, awesome. I, I'd welcome it. I'm sure I'm going to have quite a few learnings and I'll look back and say, God, that, that Jason in 2023 really didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> Well, I think that's valuable too, though, right? Like, like you said, you can do all the planning, you can do all the analysis, you can do all the research. At the end of the day, it's a risk. It may be everything you want it to be and more, and it may not, but you're doing something that you believe in, that you've thought through as well as you possibly can. And it seems like you'll also, you know, monitor how things are going and, and adjust and, that is that day-to-day work, that behind right. the scenes stuff that really, really matters and, and brings with it that consistency that I think gets lost in the world of Instagram and social media and mm-hmm. sort of the celebration of top line revenue or what store you got into, you right. know, this month, which is all important and, and right. worth celebrating. But that in that inside stuff, that behind the scenes stuff, I think we like to celebrate that and yes. showcase that because that's what we, I think we need to be reminded of. Like, you know, if I'm, I'm working quietly at my desk and I can, I can think of all the other founders who are doing the same, you know what I mean? And, and we're just all grinding. just, yeah, we're all just in our sweats d- doing the work to change the industry you know, in, in whatever ways we're, we're trying to do it. And there's, there's solidarity in that. So it's, it's fun to, to, yeah, kind of be centered in, in, and celebrating those things. Absolutely. No, I said it, said it better better than I could. It's, It's the, it's not the, there's a lot of work to get to the starting point which is truly just a starting point. Mm. Then you, mm-hmm. then you, then the path gets really weird and you got to come over here, do over here, adjust, learn, adapt, make changes. And and so uh, as much work as I've done to date, it pales in comparison to the work that's in, in my future, which I'm really excited about. 
Oh, me too. So we know your website, drinkdeo.com. Do you have social handles that we can follow uh, along? We we kept it blank until we're getting a little bit closer to launch. Just to okay. kind of have a little bit of a fresh slate, but it'll be at Drink Deo across all the major platforms. So you Perfect. can keep an eye on that as we start to, 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 to kind of prime the pump. Amazing. And then we'll link to both of those in the show notes. And so, you know, if they're live at the time that this airs or shortly thereafter, uh, folks can go there and just click and, and follow along. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time today. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I think what you've provided to us today in terms of your experience and sharing the work that you've done is super valuable. So I just want to thank you and tell you how much I appreciate you. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thanks. And, and whenever I uh, have a potential comeback, you just let me know. I'll be, I will. I'll be here. Amazing. All right. Well, happy new year. I'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. You can hear Sarah's full conversation with Jason as a plus member inside the Good Food CFO community. When you upgrade to plus membership, you get access to full length episodes, bonus clips and bonus episodes, live Q and A's with guests, and even attend live podcast recordings. To learn more about our plus membership, just visit thegoodfoodcfo.com slash join. Thank you for joining us here today. If you enjoyed this episode or found it helpful or inspiring in any way, please share it with your founder friends on social and rate and review the podcast wherever you listen. It's the number one way to help good food founders find the show. We'll be back with a brand new episode next week. 